so uh, just imagine a scenario where you have this sense that someone who is a, a friend of yours, something's just not quite right in the relationship. You're picking up on just the way they're responding to you or maybe not responding to you. The way they're speaking to you or the way they're not speaking to you. There's just been a change. And you kind of get this sense that uh, something's not right. Eye contact's not the same. Warmth isn't the same. The kind of interactiveness isn't the same. And you know something's wrong. You think to yourself, maybe at first, ah, let me just sit on this a little bit. I don't want to overreact. I don't want to create a problem where there isn't one. Maybe I'm just a little tired. Maybe I'm just a little oversensitive. And so you just kind of let it slide for a bit. But some of the same tendencies and signs continue to to give evidence of the same. You're left thinking to yourself, okay, I'm uncomfortable. What do I do? Well, maybe along the way, someone else who's part of a of a mix that includes you and, and the other person suggests to you that there was something that maybe you have done or something that maybe you have said that has caused a little bit of a hurt or offense. And you're thinking to yourself, I don't think I did that, but they apparently think I did that. I don't think I said that, at least not that way, but they apparently think I said it in a certain way. And so now you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, right? Think, okay, this is the relationship we've had for a long time, a lot of years, <clears throat> been through a lot together, ups and downs and stuff, and it's a little bit strained. So there are instinctive responses to those situations. Sometimes the instinct is, you're ticked at me over something as stupid as that. Tough rocks, deal with it. And maybe you start responding to them the same way you think they're responding to you. What happens to the relationship at that point? Hmm. That's like gasoline on the fire, huh? That ain't going to work too well. Sometimes you think to yourself, kind of feel uncomfortable, not quite sure what to do. So what I'm going to do, and this is a common instinctive response, I'm going to try to compensate for the awkwardness. I'm going to go the extra mile. I'm going to try to be nicer. I'm going to try to be warmer. I'm going to try to be friendlier. I'm going to try to be more communicative. I'm going to try to take more of an interest in their lives and their issues. I'm going to change my behavior toward them, hopefully in a positive way, without putting too much mayo on the sandwich. You know, just just try to make up for it all with the hope that that will bring down some of the awkwardness and the tensions. Can you identify with that? There is this instinctive response in us to want to make up for our shortcomings. Hopefully that that's all that will be required to fix it. Now let me say at the outset, there is a New Testament biblical principle that will in fact endorse that kind of a suggestion. The scriptures say, let love cover a multitude of sins. And in that one statement of the Apostle Peter, the principle is, you know, you don't have to confront every issue eyeball to eyeball, face to face and say, you know, you've sinned against me and I've sinned against you. And sometimes it's not that huge of a deal. Sometimes I can just choose to demonstrate a kind of sacrificial serving love and ministry to that person. And that will be the ointment of healing that God will use 
to patch up what is a little bit uncomfortable. Sometimes that works. So I don't want to minimize that. But sometimes the offense is greater and requires a little bit different strategy than just thinking if my behavior patterns toward them change and I'm nicer and warmer and cuddly and more interested, that that'll take care of it. Now, use that illustration because in the smallest of sense, this is where some of the Israelites were at during the time of Isaiah the prophet. At least a small segment. You've got a period where Isaiah comes on the scene where the people of Judah, the southern kingdom, are about as far away from a real, vital, meaningful, significant, transformative relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as far removed from that as they had ever been. And it was rather disturbing because you would have thought they would have learned from the failures of their extended family to the north in what was then called the northern kingdom of, or Israel and what happened to them. Their absolute abandonment of God, their absolute abandonment of all that he had given to them of his promises and of his word and of the voice of the prophets, their total abandonment of a relationship with him And it ultimately produced, after extended patience and forbearance, the discipline of God upon the north, where the Assyrians utterly wiped them out. Those in Judah, many of them had lived through, or at least their ancestors had lived through, the horrors of what had happened in Israel, the northern kingdom. Many of them were dead, slaughtered in battle. Many had been seized and taken off into captivity and were in Assyrian prisons. Many of them were living in abject poverty. But what was absolutely true was that the northern kingdom was no longer in existence. That was now absorbed by the Assyrian Empire. The precious kingdom that David and Solomon expanded under the blessing of God, the enrichment of God, the promise of God, it was no longer. It was gone. One would think those in the south in Judah, closer to the temple, closer to the priesthood, closer to the preachers, closer to the elders, closer to religious spiritual life there in Jerusalem, looking to the north, one would think they may have gleaned some benefit just by observing the failures of their ancestors. The northern kingdom was gone. And what's more, already through much of Isaiah's time, Assyria during Isaiah's ministry had descended upon the south, upon Judah. Three of the major cities were burned to the ground. When I did our uh, weeknight uh, video study on the archaeology of the period of the Old Testament, we saw evidences of the ruins of those major cities that were burned to the ground, evidence of fire destruction, showing what the Assyrians had done. It was as if the Assyrians were toying with the Judeans. They could have swept through Judah and wiped out Judah as quickly as they had the north. But they didn't. Town by town, city by city, village by village, they overwhelmed, ultimately surrounding Jerusalem, And the last portion of the half of Isaiah, Isaiah will bring a chronology, a a war chronicled account in four chapters of the Assyrian siege of Jerusalem under Sennacherib and Hezekiah's response and the negotiations that were taking place as the Assyrians just were enjoying toying with the Judeans. Ultimately, the miracle of God in that one occasion preserving them as the Assyrian troops were destroyed. Sennacherib goes back home, killed by his sons, and at least they're staved off for a period of time. One might expect those in Judea, the residents of Judea, would have gained some amount of wisdom from the failures of their ancestors to the north. 
as well as those surrounding them. How would they deal with the reality of their own spiritual condition? Well, the evidence from the words of Isaiah in the first chapter that we read parallels the illustration I used earlier on. What they actually tried to do was self-reform. What they actually attempted to do was to demonstrate to God that they would be better now. That they would be more faithful now. That they would be more religious now. That they would be more observant now. It's interesting. The thought was, if somehow I could show to God now that I'm a little more serious about my spiritual responsibilities and obligations as a Hebrew, that maybe the scales will weigh themselves in such a way that my efforts at self-change now will outweigh my failures of the past. And somehow God will be pleased with me. Just throw in a little more religion, a little more works, a little more effort, a little more self-change, self-improvement. Surely that's all that would be required by God. Now, we need to be careful because, quite frankly, I see that tendency that could easily crop up in my own life. And I've seen it in the lives of God's people. I've seen it over the years as a pastor, how many times people will maybe reach a place of life crises in the family and spiritually have been less than than really connected to the body of believers. And, And the response to that is one similar to the Israelites. And what I would have noticed was this family suddenly becomes a whole lot more church-focused than they had ever been before. Maybe a family that would show up on Sundays once a month, you know, once every couple of weeks. Suddenly you're recognizing they're there at church every single Sunday morning. And they're not missing a week. And not only are they there every Sunday morning, but they're dressing pretty spiffy, too. <laughs> Thinking, man, they're showing up in their Sunday glamour clothes and in, in, in the suits, and the kids are dressing up, and they're all there. They're not only there for Sunday morning, but they're even coming back then. We had Sunday evening services. They're even showing up on many of the Sunday night services. Like, boy, these people are serious. Some good stuff going on. They may even show up at Wednesday night prayer meetings. They may even come to a Sunday school class and and get involved. Heck, they're even starting to get involved in serving. Their doing is now outweighing, so they're thinking, all the stuff that had been neglected in the past. It's kind of the the indictment in the book of Revelation that uh, Jesus had against the, the believers of Ephesus. I know your deeds. They're increasing. Your church attendance, your involvement, your presence, your participation, your religious life's gone through a radical change. But the indictment is, I have this against you. You've abandoned, you've divorced yourself relationally from your, from your first love. You see, the believers then were making the same mistake, thinking that activity, change of performance, change of religious connectedness was going to outweigh the scales of all the other stuff that was underneath in their lives. And somehow God would look with a wink of approval. You're trying much harder 
you're doing so much better. It's the common mistake of religious people. Thinking that our shortcomings and failure and sinfulness can be addressed just by a change of conduct, of behavior, or of activity. Maybe in a relationship you're thinking to yourself, you've been a little bit self-centered. You're just thinking about yourself. And so the compensation is, I'm just going to be less self-centered. I'm going to try to put someone else a little bit before myself. And those are all good things and important things. But what do they fail to address? They fail to address the condition of the heart and the soul that separates me from a holy God. Isaiah chapter 1, do you note the activities enjoined by some, at least, of those who lived in Judah? Notice how their religious performance had taken on an entirely new look. The words of chapter 1 of Isaiah verse 11 indicate that they were engaged in participation of sacrifices. Do you see that in verse 11? Were they doing occasional sacrifices? What's the descriptive word coming along in verse 11 with their activity in offering sacrifices? They were giving more sacrifices than ever. Now, within the... Within the the Levitical sacrificial system of the five categories of sacrifices the Jews were challenged to offer for sin. There were sin offerings, guilt offerings, peace offerings, trespass offerings. Uh, there, there were um, uh, uh, the, the uh, burnt offerings and there were grain offerings. Not all of them were required. Some were required on a regular basis. Some were optional depending on where your life was at, where your behavior was at, what, you issue, what your issues were. And, and so you would, you would offer those sacrifices accordingly. What you have is an indicator here in verse 11 that these, um, these Hebrew people were struck with a sense of their own shortcomings, of their own rejection of the God of their ancestors, and they were recognizing they were dealing with the results of their own failures as those of the north. So their go-to response was, I'm going to just up the ante of my spiritual activity. I'm not only going to bring the lamb offerings to the priests, but I'm going to do more than I've ever done before. Kids are going to say, Pops, you're showing up in Jerusalem again with more lambs? Yes, son. Why are we doing that? We've got to atone ourselves for our failures. We've got to make up for our shortcomings. And so there they are bringing their lamb sacrifices, not only the required ones, but the optional ones. And they're bringing all the sacrifices that could be asked of them. Multiplied. See where they're going? They're just trying to produce a shift of the weight in the scales. Even with sacrifices. So they're bringing lots of sacrifices. They're also apparently from verse 12 far more active in religious worship attendance. Did you catch it in verse 12? When you are coming to appear before me, there isn't an indictment by God of whether or not they're showing up for worship. There is the presumption and assumption that they are. It's, it's like what would happen in church circles where maybe to atone for shortcomings, every time the church doors open, we're showing up. Whether others are showing up or not, we're showing up. 
Sunday morning, Sunday night, prayer meetings, Sunday school, home meetings, whatever it is. If it's church time, it's our time. And that's what they were doing. They were showing up. They were showing up at every possible time for gathering, for worship, for celebration, for sacrifices, for remembrances, for reflections. They were there. Wouldn't you think that'd be a good thing? Wouldn't you think that the local elders and, and rabbinic leaders would be looking at that and saying, man, worship attendance at the temple's really picking up these days, huh? This is a good thing. Just do the numbers. They're showing up. They're, they're also at special seasons of worship. You know, the holiday worship. Like for us, it's, you know, it's, it's Easter and, and Christmas and, and, and beyond. Every occasion imaginable. They're showing up in verse 14 for special worship festivals, the, the new moon, the seasonal festivals, the feasts, the Passover, Sukkot, the feasts of Israel. Every time there's a gathering for celebration, they're showing up. First in line, always there. Wouldn't you think God would be pleased with that? Wouldn't you think that that would be something that would cause the heart of God to be gladdened, to be celebratory? Wouldn't you expect that God would be commending them? I see a change in your religious performance. And I'm honoring that. Which makes these words rather frightening. What are your multiplied sacrifices to me? I've had enough of your burnt offerings. Don't bring them anymore. They're nauseating me. Don't bother showing up. Don't travel with your lambs to the priests for the sacrifice. I don't want to look at any one of them. I don't want to see one of those lambs slaughtered. Not for you. Don't bother. That's harsh language. I take no pleasure. There is no joy. There is no celebration. There is no heart of rejoicing from the throne room in the sacrifices for sin that were being offered. And all of these times you're coming to the temple to worship and you're showing up early and you're bringing your family, and you're wearing your clean robes, and you're showing up because it's time to show up? Who invited you? Verse 12, when you come to appear before me, who requires of you? You're trampling my courts. All you're doing is bringing in your dirt with you. You're polluting the sacred temple. I don't need your attendance. I don't need to count your numbers. It's hard language. Special worship gatherings. Verse 14, I hate them. They are a burden. They're a weight upon me. I'm weary of bearing them. Somehow it doesn't sound right, does it? I mean, all they're trying to do is make up for their past failures. All they're trying to do is improve. All they're trying to do is show God they want to be better and do better. Doesn't make them happy. It makes them more angry. The puzzle. What are they missing? What are they missing? They're missing an understanding of who God is, the heart of God. They're missing an understanding of who they are in the heart of their wretchedness. They're missing it all. If you remember several weeks ago, As God, through the prophet Isaiah, began this appeal 
to the people of Israel. Remember how repeatedly he referred to them, even in their wretched sinfulness? In in verse 2, he still calls them his sons that he had reared and brought up. In in verse 3, he still refers to them as his people. In verse 4, they're still his sons. In verse 8, they're still the daughters of Zion. They're still part of the covenant people of God, the recipients of the mercy of God, the promises of God, the blessings of God. But what they had ignored is who he was. God hadn't forgotten who they were, but they had certainly neglected who he was. He's reintroducing himself to them in verse 2 as Lord, sovereign. They had abandoned a sovereign God over their lives. He was reintroducing themselves himself to them in verse 4, as the Holy One of Israel. That prime character trait of God that they had been neglecting for generations, a holy God. I mentioned to you several weeks ago that that phrase, the Holy One of Israel, Isaiah employs 25 times in this prophetic book. Only six other times in the rest of the Old Testament. Why? Because it was that one character trait of God the people of Israel had utterly forsaken and abandoned. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. That was the God that Isaiah encountered in his redeeming moment, wasn't it? When the seraphim were worshiping at the temple, they were giving attention to the righteousness of God, the holiness of God. And then Isaiah is recognizing his own wretchedness and his own sinfulness. He cries out, I am undone. You see, in that condition for Isaiah, he understood full well that when he saw himself through the lens of who God really was and saw the utter wretchedness of his own sinful heart and nature, there would be no amount of self-transformation that would ever be able to undo the horror of the condition of a depraved sinful heart. You can't fix this one. Religious change, religious performance, religious reform, religious life, change in activity. To actually think that I could somehow shift the scales in my favor by my religious life becomes an utter offense to a holy God. It is to minimize His glory and His majesty. And it is utter arrogance to think that I am capable of self-transformation because nothing will ever change the condition of the heart. It would be a generation later when Jeremiah the prophet would cry out to a people under judgment. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately hopelessly wicked. Who can know it? And so when God speaks these words through the prophet Isaiah, and he addresses them as he does in the fourth verse, they are a sinful nation. He's not addressing their conduct and behavior. He is first and foremost addressing the condition of the essence of their heart and soul that could not be changed. A leper can't change its spots. Behavior change isn't going to fix the condition of the soul. In the words of Ezekiel, the soul that sinneth it shall die. In the words of the New Testament scriptures, we're not just sick in our sin, we're dead 
in our trespasses and sins. Sin separates us from a holy God. It's the reason Jesus came not just to model perfect life, but to pay a price for our wretchedness that only he could pay and suffer the wrath of God, the condemnation of God, the judgment of God as the Lamb of God so that you and I might have any hope of mercy and grace and redemption. So when Isaiah addresses the people of Israel as a sinful nation weighed down with iniquity, the Hebrew term weighed down means they are so oppressed and weighed down under, they are incapable of being able to offload the weight of their sin from them. They are incapable of being able to lift the guilt off of themselves by their own religious activity and an utter offense to think that the holiness of God could be satisfied by personal performance. It was a stench in the face of God. Their corruption was not found just in their actions The corruption was found from the heart. In everything that they had done, in the words of verse 4, they had abandoned the Lord and despised, hated the holy covenant God of Israel. And yet he wasn't abandoning them. They had abandoned him, but not vice versa. It is to this people that God wants to deliver promises, that God wants to deliver prophecies, that God wants to bring hope. But for the short term, it would only be found among those who would recognize the offense to a holy God and would recognize the seriousness of their own utter wretchedness. It's in that spirit that these words, while they sound harsh, are also words of appeal. We noted it several weeks ago in verse 2. He's crying out to them, please, I'm begging you. The Hebrew word Shema, listen. I'm begging you to hear me, listen to me, understand what I'm telling you. I'm trying to show you who I am. I'm trying to show you who you are. I'm trying to show you what you really need to be. I'm trying to show you you can't fix this. I'm trying to show you only I can wash this and cleanse this. I'm begging you, hear. It's again in verse 10. Hear, Shema. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to me. It's the appeal of verse 18. Come, listen, we've got to think together, reason together. You've got to understand the wretchedness of your sin. It's really in one verse. After indicting all of their rituals of self-performance, it's in one verse in verse 15 that he spells out the ultimate consequences of their real spiritual life and and their attempt at personal reform, personal life change. In spite of everything they were doing to change behavior, the reality was in verse 15 of chapter 1, here you are showing up to recite your prayers. And even by this point, rabbinic prayer chants were developed, uh, worship times where many of the psalms and prayers were read and sung. They were done rote. They were done ritualistically. They were done as form without real heart. Going through the religious service rituals. And God says to them in verse 15, You're spreading out your hands in prayer. You're singing your prayer chants. You're going through your worship rituals. And I want you to know that I'm hiding my eyes from you. I'm choosing not to see you. And I'm choosing not to hear you. Because what isn't changing is the condition 
of the depravity and wretchedness of your heart. Do, do you understand where he's going here? He wants them to be able to have a relationship with him. He wants them to be able to interact with him. He wants them to be able to hear him where they can talk together and share together and and celebrate together and rejoice together in his mercy and his forgiveness. It's impossible when the path they're choosing is one of self-change and self-reform with no repentance and no accountability for the horror of their sinfulness that is born of the heart and simply is emitted in all of their activities. Can't fix it. And so the more familiar words that we prefer to give attention to end with this summoning. It's really a call of repentance. It's, it's, really, it's a New Testament call, isn't it? It doesn't change. When, when, when the apostles, Peter first preaching in Jerusalem under the fullness of the Spirit of God, and he preaches the life and ministry of Jesus as the 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 Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world, Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah of God, who came to pay the price for our sin, what did he call the people of Jerusalem to do? Repent. Not reform, but repent. Not change your externals or change your religious worship or change your activities, but there has to be a transformation of the heart which begins by a a turning from sin and a turning explicitly under the mercy and grace of God to receive from Him what only He can provide. Washing, cleansing, forgiveness. Later, Peter would, would preach in the same city, repent so that seasons of refreshing would come from the presence of the Lord. It's Acts 3 and and verse 19. And and there's that constant call to repentance. It's the call of God through Isaiah to the people of Israel in verse 16 and following. It is not that they are washing themselves or making themselves clean, but rather it's more in the passive voice. It is understanding that we need to place ourselves before God for His washing of us. We need to place ourselves before God so that He alone can make us clean because I realize it's not my religious change of performance that's going to going to alter the condition of the wretchedness of my sinful heart. I'm literally, Lord, at your mercy. Unless you wash me, I remain dirty. Unless you cleanse me, I remain filthy. Unless you remove the evil from within me, All of my efforts at self-transformation will get me nowhere. And that's really his appeal. It's only by repentance and the grace and mercy of God that washes and cleanses of sin that allows for a heart desire for transformed living. It's, it's the reason for the familiar words of verse 18 where God summons the people of Israel to a realistic assessment of their condition. Your sins are scarlet, they're red. Which not only is a, a, a metaphor for blood, but perhaps greater than that, those are colors that were easily recognized. God saying, I see and know the depth of the wretchedness of your heart. And I'm the only one who can remove all of that and cause you to be from the inside out whiter than snow. I've had people say to me, why would the imagery be there of snow? It snows in Israel. In fact, just the other week, There was a scene on the news 
the cold that struck, and there at the, in Jerusalem at the, at the Wailing Wall, it was snowing, the ground was covered in Jerusalem. It, it's not common, it's rare. But when it comes, they recognize the imagery of the covering of snow. Up in the northern Galilee regions and the mountain areas, it snows and the mountaintops are filled. This was a real image that they could identify with. The God of grace and mercy wanted to speak truth to the rebellious, contentious, obstinate, distant people of Israel who had long abandoned him. And rather than God being angry with them to judgment, this same God wanted to speak truth to them wanted to bring hope for them, both then and forever. But it wasn't going to happen if their only course of action was, I'll try to do better now. It was only going to happen when they would come in brokenness and repentance and allow him to cause them to be whiter than snow. Allow him to wash themselves, him removing the evil from their lives. And then in a transformative work, their motivation would be no longer an interest in evil, but rather a passion in living righteously and justice. It's interesting that the illustrations of verse 17 became the ultimate demonstrations of selflessness. Because what frequently disappeared among the people of Israel was the care for the most needy among them. The orphans and the widows. And what God is saying to them, if you will allow me to so change your heart from the inside out, I will alter your motivation and life purpose to such a degree that the things in your life that have the least significance will now have the greatest. Because it's really all going to be about me and serving me and honoring me and worshiping me and walking with me. 2,700 years ago speaks to us today. To a generation of people who will think that just by self-improvement and self-transformation, I can make up for the wretchedness of my sin. And the good news of the gospel is, if that were true, Jesus would never have come. It is precisely because of the impossibility of all that he came. And we celebrate that this morning as we come to the Lord's table. It is the experience of Isaiah as he's preaching. He saw his own wretchedness. He saw his own sinfulness. There is the the coals of God's purging that cleansed Isaiah's heart and transformed his purpose. It it was the, the experience of King David, wasn't it? As he cried out to God, against you, you only have have I sinned and done what is evil in, in your sight. He cries out for the mercy of God and the grace of God and the cleansing of God and the washing of God. For apart from the transformation of the heart, there could never be a transformation of the life. The consistency of the message of Scripture is rather remarkable, isn't it? The Old Testament message, the New Testament message, it's really the same. The big difference is that the The blood of the offerings of the Old Covenant were repeated over and over and over again. But God sends Jesus as the once for all sacrifice. As the perfect priest, the perfect mediator, the perfect substitute, the perfect sacrifice who offers himself once and for all that you and I by repentance and faith in him can have absolute cleansing and forgiveness. Isn't it great to know 
that we don't have to self-reform, but when God changes us from the inside out, he produces in us his heart, his desire, his motivation, his longing. We need to allow him to do that in us. Then we're able to take in the promises of God and the hope of God that Isaiah was bringing to the people of Israel. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come to the elements of your table and we remember what Jesus provided for us, we are grateful, our Father, that our hope for forgiveness, both now and forever, is found not in our own efforts, not in our own religion, not in our own rituals, not in our own rights, but in what you have done for us alone that we could never do for ourselves. We worship you with gratitude for your grace and mercy that is found for us only in Jesus, whom we praise alone in his name. Amen.